Welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us today um, for the September edition of uh, RefCom Communities webinar series. I'm Becky Peterson and I'm the content lead for RefCom events. Um, we have with us today Chuck Monroe from Spraying Systems. He will be presenting to you. Um, he has been with Spraying Systems for 30 years and has worked with almost every industry during this time. He has spent most of the time with petro petrochemical and chemical applications and has focused mostly on refineries and sulfuric acid markets over the last 10 years. Chuck? Thank you, Becky. Appreciate that. And uh, good morning, everybody. And thank you for joining us for our presentation today on spray nozzles and injectors and FCC applications. Uh, today, during the presentation, we're going to go over a few different applications within the FCC. And this is not going to be necessarily refinery specific. In other words, you're not going to learn anything here about refinery processes or procedures that you don't already know. This is going to be focusing on the spray technology side. And if you can have a better understanding of about how the spray nozzles work, how the spray technology works, then we can get to a point where we can have improved safety, reliability, and operational efficiency within these units. For those of you who don't know much about Spraying Systems Company, and I imagine that most of you probably do, we are a privately held company. We're about 85 years old, and our uh, global and world, our global and corporate headquarters is located in the Chicago suburbs of Wheaton. And we have two manufacturing facilities in the U.S., and over the over the 85 years, we've grown to have probably over 14 manufacturing facilities around the world. So we are truly a global company. And so no matter where you are located in the world, we do have engineering, sales, service, and support uh, close by you. Another thing to note is that as I go through the presentation, I'll be talking about spray injectors and spray nozzles and such. I kind of use these terms interchangeably. Also, I will, the, the injectors and things that I talk about are things that we actually design and manufacture in-house. I'll also be mentioning talking about spray characterization and I'll touch on computational fluid dynamics. These are also things that we do in-house as well for modeling and analysis purposes. And we also have a spray analysis group that does prototyping, testing. So whatever your spray nozzle or spray technology needs are, spraying systems is the experts in spray technology. So after that brief little commercial, we can get started on our presentation. In the spray nozzle world, we tend to have a, a chip on our shoulder. And I say that because a lot of times the spray nozzle tends to be something that gets overlooked. People think of it just as like a piece of metal with a hole drilled in it. It's a very small component in a very large, complex, costly systems. So a lot of times the spray nozzle gets shoved to the side and not thought of as being very important. But it, it plays a very critical role in a lot of the applications and actually in all of the applications I'm going to discuss today. And if you think about it this way, the spray nozzle tends to be the last thing that the injected fluid sees before it hits the receiving stream or it hits the target surface. So the spray nozzle is really what prepares the, the liquid in order to do its job. So if you look at it that way, you can definitely see how the spray nozzle is very important. So having said that, what you're looking at right here is the formation of a spray pattern through a hydraulic spray nozzle as we are increasing pressure. And we do this in order to increase flow rate. And as we do this, we're, it, we're trying to break up a bulk liquid into drops or droplets. And when we do that, we end up getting a wide range of drop sizes. So first of all, spray nozzles do not have a single droplet size. There's a wide range of drop sizes. And that range of drop sizes and the formation of those droplets depends on many different factors. It depends on such things as the type of spray nozzle that you use. And you may have heard of terms such as full cone or hollow cone or quill or two fluid nozzle. All of these are types of spray nozzles. It also depends on the capacity or the flow rate of the spray nozzle. So let's say I have a single type of spray nozzle like a full cone nozzle and I have one that flows a higher flow rate than another at the same pressure drop, that higher flow rate spray nozzle will have larger droplets. It also depends on the pressure, as you can see right here. As we are increasing pressure in order to increase our flow rate, 
the droplet size goes down. And of course, as we reduce the pressure, the droplet size goes back up. It depends also on the spray angle. Wider spray angle spray nozzles tend to have smaller droplets. And as you can imagine, it depends on the rheology of the fluid you're spraying. Surface tension, density, viscosity, all of these things play a role in how that spray pattern is formed and the drop sizes that are formed through it. And if we're gonna be talking about drop sizes, it's important that we're kind of looking all at the same thing or speaking the same language, if you will. And when we talk about drop size terminology, we tend to characterize it in volume-based criteria or count-based criteria. And what you're looking at right here is a drop size distribution curve. And this particular curve right here, the numbers underneath the curve are valid for only one nozzle at one pressure and one fluid. If we change any of those factors, the numbers on this uh, graph right here will change. But one of the things that we can learn from volume-based criteria is what is the maximum droplet size. So let's say I have an application that is like a evaporative cooling application or a combustion application, and I have a particular residence time, and I need to make sure that that largest droplet gets evaporated or combusted in that time period. Understanding what those larger droplets are is very important to me. Another thing that I can learn from volume-based criteria is what's known as this DV 0.5, or also called volume median diameter. And what this droplet size refers to is that half of the droplets by volume are smaller than this particular droplet size. And the reason that I focus on this is that there are a lot of times, and you'll see it in literature all over the place, whether it's a NACE or API, or even in a phone call, somebody will say, I need a spray nozzle with a 500 micron drop size, but they don't say what that is. So if you're ever in a discussion about droplets, always make sure to reference the unit. So you can be 500 microns, that could be the maximum droplet, it could be the average, it could be the median, and these are all gonna be different numbers, and they could also reference a different type of spray nozzle. Another thing that we can learn from volume-based criteria is what's called relative span factor. Now, this is a dimensionless number, and it helps us to compare one nozzle to another as it relates to the similarity of those drop sizes. So remember, every drop size, is, every spray nozzle is going to have a range of drop sizes, and they're all going to change depending on the type of spray nozzle that you're using. The other criteria that we use in order to talk about drop size terminology is count-based criteria. And for the most part in the refineries, this is really where you're going to live. And the term that is most often used in refineries is what's called the D32 micron drop size or solder mean diameter. This particular droplet has the same volume to surface area ratio as the volume of the liquid sprayed to the surface area created by the spray. And the reason why it's important for most of the applications in the refinery is because we're talking about mass transfer here. The greater the surface area, the more, uh, the more efficient the mass transfer can become. And this next slide is very good at explaining how this actually happens. So let's say I have a single droplet and it has a diameter of 500 microns. Well, I can calculate my volume and surface area on that particular droplet. But now let's say I take that single droplet and I break it up into 125 equally sized droplets of 100 micron each. My volume hasn't changed, but my surface area has increased by 500%. And this is really what the power of the spray nozzle is. This is what the spray nozzle can do for you. So if you ever have an application where mass transfer is critical, since mass transfer is proportional to the droplet surface area, being able to create that surface area as you're injecting it into the receiving stream puts the liquid into the position for best possible success. So this is really what we're talking about when we're talking about the spray nozzle and what it can do for you in these applications. Some things to think about when considering spray nozzles is the spray coverage and flow rate. These are actually obviously very uh, important. Uh, density, viscosity, surface tension I've talked about percent solids, do you have any particular solids in the fluid that you're spraying? If you do, there are certain types of spray nozzles that can maximize the free passage through those, and also the material considerations. A lot of the applications in the refineries not only can be subjected to erosion, but can be su subjected to corrosion as well because of the substances in, within the uh, processes. The spray nozzles that we use mostly in the refinery applications are full cone, 
holocone in two fluid spray nozzles. Full cone and hollow cone spray nozzles are what we call hydraulic spray nozzles. And that basically just means that we have a single fluid, a liquid, and we have a formed orifice that creates that back pressure versus flow rate relationship and enables us to create the spray pattern and the drop sizes that we're looking for. Then we also have a two fluid spray nozzle, but I'm gonna go through each one of these individually to give you more detail on them. With a full cone spray nozzle, the liquid enters on the inlet of the spray nozzle back here. And as it enters, there is a vein inside of here. And when the liquid enters, hits this stationary vein, the liquid starts to swirl. And as it swirls, some of the liquid exits the spray nozzle on this formed orifice and goes toward the outside. Some of it bypasses and comes through the inside. The liquid on the inside tends to have larger droplets than the liquid on the outside. So one of the things about the full cone spray nozzle is it tends to have a larger drop size distribution than most other standard spray nozzles. Also, because the liquid on the inside, the full cone nozzle also tends to have larger droplets than most standard spray nozzles. And another thing about the full cone spray nozzle to understand is that the, the vein itself is the limiting factor when it comes to maximum free passage. Now, maximum free passage refers to the ability of the spray nozzle to pass particulates through the spray nozzle without clogging, which is obviously is very important. Most people think that the, that the limiting factor is the exit orifice, but it actually resides within the vein itself. So if you're ever looking for something wanting to size a strainer, especially for like water wash applications, and it's not immediately known, always refer to and find out what the maximum free pass of spray nozzle is. The next type of spray nozzle that we'll look at is what's called a hollow cone. And with a hollow cone, the liquid enters on our inlet back here, and then there's a throat that directs the liquid into this whirl chamber. And when the throat enters the whirl chamber, it enters on a tangent, which causes the liquid inside here to spin. And as this liquid is spinning, it gets thrust to the outside, and there's an air core that forms in the center here. And then the liquid exits the nozzle off of this formed orifice, creating this annular or holocone spray pattern. Now, since the liquid in the holocone spray nozzle all exits particularly pretty much the same way, the drop size distribution tends to be more similar. Not the same, but just the drop size distribution tends to be more similar than it is with the full cone spray nozzle. Also, a hollow cone spray nozzle tends to have smaller droplets than a full cone. And the other thing about the hollow cone is that since there is no vein inside here, it also tends to have a larger maximum free passage. Hollow cone and full cone nozzles, for the most part in refineries, are somewhat interchangeable. They seem to be used in a lot of the same types of applications, mostly in, in the FCC unit, they're mostly going to be used in water wash applications. The other difference between the hollow cone and the full cone, as you can see here, is that the liquid exits perpendicular to our inlet axis. And we'll discuss why that is uh, important a little bit later on. The next type of the next type of spray nozzle that we're going to talk about is a two fluid spray nozzle. Now, this one we have our primary fluid, which is going to be our liquid, and then we have our secondary fluid, which is going to be a gas. So this particular design, it's a pipe and pipe design. So we have the liquid coming in the center and then we have the gas coming in on the outside. This is what's called a internal mix, meaning that the liquid and the gas meet internally to this chamber prior to exiting the spray nozzle. When this happens, you have a lot more control because the back pressure of one can be played off the back pressure of the other. For instance, you can set the gas pressure at a particular pressure and then you can increase or decrease the liquid pressure to change your flow rate, or you can set the liquid pressure constant and change your gas pressure. Two fluid spray nozzles are used in most, for the most part in FCC applications are used in things like regenerator off gas scrubbing or off gas cooling. They're used in torch oil. They're used in slurry back flush, and they're also used in fresh feed injectors where you have oil as your primary fluid and you have steam as your secondary fluid. The other type of two fluid spray nozzle other than the internal mix is what's called the external mix, which is what you see here on the bottom picture. So we have the liquid and the gas that do not meet until they exit the spray nozzle. So they're both, they're both independent of each other. 
Now I'm going to have to go over to a video over here real quick, and I want to show you what we're talking about when we talk when we're comparing one spray nozzle to another, one spray nozzle type to another. So what you're going to see in this video is a hydraulic spray nozzle on the left. So the left two panels is a hollow cone spray nozzle. The right two panels is a two fluid spray nozzle. The two panels on the top, both of the spray nozzles are spraying five gallons per minute. And the bottom two panels, both, both spray nozzles are spraying two gallons per minute. So the term we're going to use here is what's called turn down. Now, turn down refers to the ability of a spray nozzle to go from a high flow rate to a low flow rate or a high pressure to a low pressure, whichever way you want to look at it. But what happens when we're doing that? So let's look at this top left spray as it's spraying right now, this Holocon spray nozzle. This is a good spray pattern. This is it's operating exactly the way that it should. But now instead of five gallons per minute, when we turn it down to two gallons per minute, I hope that you can see on this left hand bottom panel where these where now we have some larger droplets that are able to be seen and this is because we've reduced the pressure now just so you know this particular spray pattern in the bottom left hand uh, panel here is a good spray pattern that is a valid very good spray pattern but it also still has larger droplets if we look at the two panels on the right if there were no words or anything right here it'd be very difficult to determine which one is which and that's because when you're using a two fluid spray nozzle, you tend to have more similar performance over a much greater turn down range. So the two fluid nozzle, since you have that extra fluid in there, that gas, that you're able to operate it more assuredly or better or the better, the better performance over a wider range. Incidentally, with uh, two fluid spray nozzles, yeah, the secondary fluid can be pretty much anything that can be used within the process stream itself. Think of things like compressed air, steam, uh, hydrogen, natural gas, nitrogen, any of these things can be used. So going back to the video we just saw, the thing that, that's important to understand about turndown is that we always want to be operating in what's called the fully developed spray regime. And if you have a very low pressure drop, let's say you have something like maybe 10 or 20 PSI delta P available, and then you want to, but you also have a, a large flow rate range that you need to uh, operate in. If you go below the operating pressure, the minimum operating pressure of the particular spray nozzle, and they all have different minimum operating pressures, you're going to start to get in the region where you're not actually developing a spray pattern. So when looking at these and when designing your system, always know what your capabilities are as it relates to turndown. This next video I'm going to show right here is has to do with, as I get over here to the screen, this next video has to do with people wanting to know if their spray nozzles are still working or not. And a lot of times you'll see and refineries, especially in water wash applications, people will remove the injector and they'll spray it and they'll just visually check to see if it's valid or not, if it's still working or not. Well, we'll see how well this actually happens. On the left-hand screen, this is a brand new full cone spray nozzle and it's spraying exactly what it should. This is actually around 43 gallons per minute at 40 PSI. The right-hand video, we've taken that brand new spray nozzle and we've put some metal pieces in it to simulate a plug spray nozzle. And now it actually is plugged. So now at 40 PSI, it's only spraying around 23 gallons per minute. So what happens if we just looking at the video on the right? It doesn't look that bad, actually. We have, we're actually getting a full cone spray pattern. But if we compare it to the video on the left, now we could start to see a lot of differences. First of all, the video on the left, you can see our distribution of the droplets is much more even throughout the spray, we have a much better concentration of droplets throughout the spray. And it also, you can see that it has a much more stable looking spray. This, when this sp spray pattern right here is jumping all around, it means that we're not getting consistent performance. And also now we can start to see some voids in the center here, and we can start to see a lot of liquid on the outside. This means that our droplet distribution across the spray pattern is not as good, once again, affecting performance. So it's always a good idea to check to make sure that the spray nozzle is still working 
but you cannot trust your eyes all the time unless you're actually comparing it to something. A better way of doing this actually would be to use a flow meter and a pressure gauge, which uh, is important for, for all spray nozzle applications, actually. That way you know if, you, if it has deviated from what's shown in the catalog. This is another thing that I like to show, and this is actually not in a refinery, but it's a very telltale uh, as far as being able to trust what you're seeing. The left two nozzles are, are brand new, and the right two, obviously, you can see that they're very, very worn. In this particular application, their control system was set up so that they were monitoring and they, were, they had a, a feedback loop on flow rate. So as these nozzles started to wear, they had either a variable frequency drive pump or some sort of pressure regulator that would change, that would modulate the, the flow rate. So on their screens, on the readout screens in the control room, they were always seeing the exact same flow rate. But they didn't understand that at, over time, the pressure in order to operate at that flow rate was actually reducing. And once again, what happens there is that the drop size goes up. And then real, in reality, what was happening toward the end here is they were just pouring their liquid out of the spray nozzles. But the control in the control room, everything looked to be OK. Once again, monitoring flow rate and pressure is very important if you want to have accurate feedback on your spray nozzles. So now we'll get into uh, some of the different applications. The first one we're going to talk about is water wash. And water wash is very important, and I've already touched on some of the aspects of water wash. But what we're trying to do with the water wash is we're trying to uh, scrub the overhead gas in the main fractionator, and we're trying to prevent salts from forming. And if we're not able to prevent the salts from forming, any salts that have formed, we want to be able to dissolve them downstream with any free water that we have left over. So that's kind of basically what we're trying to achieve here. And we do this by using injectors, spray injectors. So what we're going to do here is we're going to talk about different types of spray injectors. And with the spray injectors, you have different options. You have quills, and you have uh, spray nozzles you can use. A quill is something that we define as a pipe that does not have a spray nozzle on the end of it. it, does not have an engineered spray technology on the end of it. It can be a pipe with holes drilled in the side, as you see here. It could be a 45 degree bevel, which you see often. It could have a rectangular orifice cut in it, which you see often, especially in hydro treaters. But this is just another method of getting fluid into the receiving stream. So in this particular setup, we have a wind tunnel. The top two panels in the wind tunnel is a two-hold quill. The bottom two panels is a two-spray nozzle spray injector. The two panels on the left, the wind in the wind tunnel is flowing at 20 meters per second. And the wind in the, on the right two panels has been increased to 30 meters per second. And let's take a look at the spray patterns and see if we can see any differences comparing, comparing the two. Well, first of all, with the quill, you see these long white streaks. These are ligaments that actually have not formed droplets yet. You do see some droplet formation over here, but by and large, most of the liquid that's coming out is not, uh, is not forming droplets. And you also see that you have a very unstable spray, which means that your performance is not consistent. And you also have a very, very small cross section of the pipe that it is actually contacting for the so that when your receiving stream is not able to contact the liquid with a sp spray nozzle you have much better uh, much more stable performance you're actually creating droplets and you're getting better coverage over the cross section of the pipe so what does this mean in practice well the quill in order for it to work properly it is thought that you just need to get the liquid into the receiving stream and the velocity of the gas coming by will provide secondary shear to provide the droplet breakup that you need. All of these spray nozzles are spraying the exact same flow rate. And the spray nozzle is the only thing that is actually creating those droplets. And if we can increase the gas flow, the gas velocity from 20 to 30 meters per second, we should be able to see a decrease in droplet size because of that secondary shear. But in reality, this does not occur. For most applications, especially if you're injecting liquid into gas, a spray nozzle is going to be the, be the better choice. 
Now, quills can be used for some applications such as liquid into liquid injection, and they can be used for uh, applications where you have very, very, very low flow rates or very high gas velocities. So just keep that in mind for your next water wash application. Another thing, another uh, way of looking at this, so those were around five gallons per minute each. And so what happens if I increase the flow rate to a much larger, much more uh, realistic flow rate for the application? This right here is comparing a quill. These are all around 40 gallons per minute. This is a slotted quill. This is a full cone spray nozzle. And then this is a two fluid spray nozzle. So once again, you can see right here, we have nothing but ligaments here. And with the flow rate that we're injecting into here, it would, it would require an extremely high gas velocity to, to provide any type of secondary shear. The full cone nozzle, we do have droplets being formed. It's much better than the quill. And then the two fluid spray nozzle, you see how soft the spray pattern looks, almost like a, like a cotton candy, if you will. And that's because the droplets are much, much smaller. Once again, all three of these are around the same flow rate, around 40 gallons per minute each. So now that we have actually chosen a spray nozzle for our water wash application, we need to think about things uh, as far as such as inserting it into the process pipe. So what are some of the things that we think about or what are necessary or important for the application? Is, is my pipe, is it horizontal or vertical? Well, the droplets that are coming out of the spray nozzle are obviously affected by gravity. So the size of the spray of the droplet as well as the velocity of the gas need to be taken into consideration to determine whether or not those droplets will be entrained and be able to stay within the gas flow. So if you have, for the most part, if in a, in a perfect world, we would always be spraying water vertically downward, but that is not the case. We need to be able to model these injectors. We need to be able to model these so that the droplets are gonna be entrained in the gas because once these droplets hit the walls of the pipe, they form a wall film, and then we've lost, we've lost the ability to have that surface area that we were looking for for that contact time. The other thing is, is, one, is to determine whether or not we have elbows or bends before or after the spray injectors, and because that's gonna affect the flow. And another thing is, is whether or not we have, we're spraying co-current or counter-current. Now, this is a, this is a, question that gets asked a lot and I have a video here to show you what actually this looks like. This is once again in the wind tunnel we have a hollow cone spray nozzle and we're this the flow rate of the spray nozzle remains the same but we're increasing the velocity of the gas from 10 to 25 meters per second and you can see how the liquid turns back on itself and you can also see how the liquid starts to hit this pipe in the spray nozzle and the liquid starts to agglomerate on this and drop out for the most part for most applications you want to spray co-current meaning with the gas flow and the reason is is because we have a lot more control over that and we have a lot more knowledge about what that actually looks like so there are some applications, not too many, there are some applications where people choose to, to spray countercurrent, and those may have to do if it's like an evaporative cooling application where you want to increase the residence time or something. But for the most part, for most applications, we want to keep that, we want to keep the flow going co-current with the gas flow. Another thing that affects the, the actual spray nozzle selection is clearance. So in this picture right here, we have a receiving pipe. This is our process pipe, and this is our tie-in point with a flange. This bore ID right here, this clearance diameter right here, tends to be a, a very big determinant on the type of spray nozzle that you can insert. So especially if you don't have any water wash uh, injectors in there right now, you, somebody will come to me and say, hey, I have a two inch flange right here and I need 30 or 40 gallons per minute. Well, it's just not going to fit. You're not going to be able to find a spray nozzle to fit through that particular 
uh, diameter right there. So let's go back to what we talked about before as far as hollow cone and full cone. This is a retractable injector. We have an isolation valve here. We have a flange that, that mounts to that tie-in point. Remember that the hollow cone spray nozzle, the liquid exits perpendicular to our inlet axis. So this spray nozzle by design requires a smaller clearance than a full cone spray nozzle. So there are a lot of situations where we're working with the refinery and their specifications call out that they require a full cone spray nozzle for a water wash application. And because of the particular tie-in point, we need, to, we need to drop down, we need to look at a hollow cone spray nozzle right now. So sometimes some concessions need to be made as far as design goes, and sometimes a different tie-in point needs to be installed because the spray nozzle just won't fit. Even, even sometimes the hollow cone nozzles won't fit. Other than uh, droplet size, one of the things that we can also look at for water wash that's important is making sure that we get the coverage we need inside the pipe itself. And we do that by uh, testing different types of spray nozzles within a wind tunnel and validating that coverage. On the upper left-hand side right here, you see, this, you see this green spot right here. This is actually a laser sheet, laser sheet image. And what we can do, this is the exit of a wind tunnel and we can have spray nozzle back here spraying. And as it passes through this laser, this planar laser right here, we can look at the density or the concentration of that spray over that cross section. This right here is a quill. This is a bevel ended quill. And as the liquid passes through that laser, we're able to see that we're getting about 24% coverage over that cross section. If we use a spray nozzle with the exact same flow rate, we're able to get 97% coverage. This means that the spray nozzle is giving us a four to one advantage over the quill. Now with injectors, with quills, whenever we're injecting something into the process pipe on a water wash, we're actually trying to affect something. And if we are not able to get contact with the gas and the liquid in a quill situation right here, then we are not actually attaining what we're trying to achieve, which is, which is the water wash itself being able to use a spray nozzle gives us a much more efficient operation. The next application we're going to turn to is torch oil and slurry back flush. Now I lump these together primarily because they tend to use the same type of equipment. And a lot of the equipment that we see in the field is homemade equipment. I've seen pipes that have been beaten down with a hammer to create a flat spray. I've seen all sorts of different things. And there are a couple different types of technologies that can be used for this. And we're gonna take a look at those right here. One of the things that people will do is they will take a hydraulic nozzle, whether it's a full cone nozzle or whether it is a uh, flat spray nozzle, and they will inject their steam and their oil in at the same time. In order, to, uh, in order to achieve a kind of a pseudo two fluid spray nozzle. And so we'll, we'll look at that versus a spray injector that's designed for two fluid spray. The injector on the left is a, or actually it's on the far side here, is a hydraulic spray nozzle. And the reason I have unstable spray performance on here is because when you're putting the liquid and the gas in that pipe together, you actually are seeing slug flow at this point in time. So, and that's causing this unstable spray. You see it can kind of modulates in and out. This is the two fluid spray nozzle designed for this service and you have a much more consistent spray. And you can get this in flat, you can get this in round. But the point here is that there are technologies that can, that are better suited for particular types of applications. And if you are going to go, and if you are going to deviate from the two fluid spray, it's best to use something that has been engineered so that you get more consistent approaches, more consistent performance over time if, once you start to replace your equipment. This next slide right here, this would be something that would be considered the, the hydraulic spray where we have the liquid and the gas coming in and the liquid and the gas meet internal to this pipe before leaving. And then you were able to see that that spray as it was bouncing all around. Then this is the two fluid spray. In this particular one, 
the oil is on the outside and the steam is on the inside and they do not meet until the tip right here and it's designed to be done that way so that you get more consistent performance. Now you can have uh, discussions about reliability, you can have discussions about performance and about what's more important. The important thing here is to understand that you have options here and to get into that line of communication when you're designing your next torch oil or slurry backflush project. The next application we're gonna look at is regenerator off gas quench. And with this one, you have the, the, as you come off the regenerator going to the CO boiler, you have extremely hot gas. And in some situations, refineries will install spray nozzles for emergency cooling. And then in other situations, refineries will install spray nozzles to, to keep the cooling within a particular zone. You wanna, you wanna capture as much of that heat as possible, but sometimes there are upset conditions where you require emergency cooling. And we do this typically by using two fluid high flow rate spray nozzles where we're using water and then we typically use steam as our secondary fluid. In this application right here, we have the regenerator and then the green here is the velocity profile of the gas coming off the regenerator. And I don't have the video for the CFD because of the, the platform we're using right now, but I'll try to explain this the best that I can. Right here, you have five injectors that are proposed to be put in this position. And you can see them also in this arrangement right here. Now, originally, the refinery wanted to put them back here because this gave them the longest straight run. And it's a, it's, it would seem to be a good position because that would give you the longest residence time, right? But the problem was is that when we did the CFD on this, we saw this gas recirculation zone right here, this little dead zone. And what happened was is that disrupted the, the, the droplets as they were coming out in an effective performance. Now, we already knew the flow rate we needed. We already knew the droplet size that was needed. We already knew the number of spray nozzles that was needed. And the next thing to do was to determine the placement of those particular spray nozzles. So right here in this image right here, we have these are the five injectors on the outside of that elbow. This is the inside of the elbow where we saw the gas recirculation and the gas is coming in this direction. And you see you have a lot of turbulence in here and those droplets were able to, to go through, were able to penetrate that gas coming through and we're only able to get 92% evaporation. Since we were under, understood where the gas was flowing in here, we were able to take two of those injectors and move them on the inside, take advantage and move them also downstream to take advantage of that gas that was coming around the bend. And just by changing the placement, we were able to increase the evaporation to 99%. And this is the video that I wanted to show, but I'm not actually able to show. But this is, once again, is the, the gas will be coming in this direction and then moving away from you. These were the five injectors in the original proposed arrangement. And then this one, we took two of those, moved them on the inside of that elbow and moved them down. And in the CFD, you're actually able to see a, a lot of droplets right here hitting this wall. Now, the reason why it was important to keep them off is because this particular duct was refractory lined and they knew that if they continue to have uh, water hitting this that they might have some reliability problems down down the line cracked bricks or what have you so with this we're able to reduce the wall wetting from 7.8 to 0 0.7 to 0 0.7 percent and once again the important thing here is that it was it was the placement of the spray nozzles that was critical and that could only be determined by computational fluid dynamics. And this is another uh, horror story. This is actually a steel line duct and this uh, happened because of poor nozzle selection and poor nozzle placement and uh, they did not get the cooling that they needed. Another thing about regenerator off gas quench is that in that gas stream, you have catalyst vines and those catalyst vines can act as a uh, sandblaster, if you will. And so we need to be able to protect the equipment once we put it in there, especially if it's gonna be emergency quench uh, because some of these things won't be turned on for long periods of time, maybe even if ever. So right here we have our 
spray injector on the inside. We have, this is almost a sacrificial shield on the outside. This is, uh, has a special coating to reduce the effects of erosion from the catalyst fines, and it just makes a much more reliable system. So it's, it's understanding the application and understanding the needs in order to increase the reliability over time. The last application I'm going to touch on isn't something that you see a lot of, but it is something that we've touched on with some different refineries over the years, and that's regenerator shell cooling. And this happens when you start to have damaged brick in the top of your regenerator, and you will have uh, the shell, the, the steel shell on the outside starts to get these hot spots, and we need to cool them down. And there are different ways of doing it. Sometimes people will run hoses up there and let water just run off of it. And that really creates a housekeeping nightmare because you're constantly having water uh, running off of the regenerator over time. Another, another good way to do it is to use two fluid spray nozzles. So you can have uh, two fluid nozzles that have very, very small droplets and you can spray it onto uh, portions of the shell in order, to, in order to cool it. But if you don't get rapid evaporation, then you can also have water running off Another way to do it is you use what's called an air amp amplifier. And with the air amplifier, you are taking steam, steam only, and you are injecting it into the air amplifier, which then entrains air behind it and enables you to, enables you to direct that steam plus air onto the, uh, onto the shell itself. So here I am kind of just demonstrating it. You have a 3 8 inch inlet over here where your steam comes in into the side of the amplifier. You have air coming in on the back side, and then it exits the, uh, on the other side on to your left on the screen. And you can actually feel the air being pulled in from the steam. And as it exits the, on the other side, you get a column of, of steam plus air, entrained air. And then what you could do is you can angle that toward the shell and increase the area that you're covering. And this is a this is a, an excellent way of doing shell cooling for the uh, if you ever have hot spots on your on your regenerator. And with that, uh, that is it. That's the, uh, the just the brief overview of some different applications and things to think about. And I'd like to say thank you for your attention. I hope this was helpful. I do know that there are some questions here, and. Becky, if there's nothing else going on, I can kind of get to some of these questions. Um, yes, see. absolutely. You have plenty of time. Okay. So let me kind of go down to, all right. Uh, what is the smallest nozzle for FCC applications in terms of mass flow throughput that spraying systems has in their portfolio, particularly targeting bench scale or pilot scale applications? What is the smallest nozzle for FCC application? Oh, Lord, that is a, that's a tough one. I mean, we can get down to, we can get down to gallons per day, depending on what you're actually trying to do. Uh, it also depends on the type of spray nozzle. If it's a water wash application and it's a single fluid or hydraulic, we're talking about probably uh, a couple tenths of a gallon per minute. Uh, if we're talking about two fluid, we can get it down even lower than that. So it depends on the uh, depends on the actual application itself. But those are whether it's two fluid or hydraulic. But that kind of gives you an idea. Another one is how do you know the nozzle is worn out? Can you tell that a nozzle is worn by monitoring pressure readings or other sources such as vibration monitoring? Well, as I mentioned before, the the best way to tell is by doing is by comparing pressure to flow rate. So all of these spray nozzles will have a pressure versus flow rate curve. And if you look at any catalog of any spray nozzle manufacturer, they're going to show you what that information is. So you can either put that in some sort of um, IOW in your system, some sort of alarm system, and then you can compare what you're getting, your, your flow versus pressure, and you can say, well, I want to I don't want to deviate more than 10% of my flow rate off of this pressure or something like that. Vibration monitoring, I'm not sure that's the best way to do it, but I, I think that I would definitely, definitely use uh, some sort of flow meter and pressure gauge. Chuck, I'm sorry Another... to interrupt you. Would you unshare uh -huh. your screen, please? Oh, I am so sorry. 
Okay. Is that better? All right. Uh, I apologize for that. So did you hear, did you hear what I was saying? Yes, we could hear you. Okay. All right. So uh, next question is, in one of our FCC units, we have issues of feed nozzle tip getting plugged with coke type material. Can lower tip velocity lead to higher residence time and coke forming tendencies? Uh, that's kind of a tough one. I mean, you don't want the tip velocity to go too low because if you do, you're not gonna be able to get penetration into the, into the riser itself. And also lower tip velocity will uh, probably lead to larger droplet size. So I know that every licensor has their own ways of doing things, their own philosophy on how this needs to be handled. And I think that I would talk to them about it. But if you are having, uh, if you are having plugage or coking on the, on the tips itself, then there might be another issue. But you don't want to get too low of a tip velocity. You don't want to get too high either because you don't want to damage the catalyst. So you, you need to talk to your licensor to stay within the sweet spot for how that particular FCC unit is designed. And another one is in a twin fluid nozzle, should the gas and liquid be mixed at the entry point or towards the exit point of the nozzle? Which one will have more fluctuations in the flow and pressure? Uh, that actually, I was, I mentioned that if you go back to the video I showed of the two injectors spraying, the injector on the left is, is a situation where the gas and the liquid are mixed upstream of the spray nozzle and they're mixed inside the pipe itself. And then on a uh, two fluid nozzle designed for two fluid spray that the, uh, the liquid and the gas mix either at the tip or outside of the spray nozzle. And what this does is that it gives you more control and actually gives you better performance because it is, it is engineered and designed to be that way. Whenever, you're, whenever you mix them together, your performance is not necessarily going to be as good. You're not going to get the best droplet size. You're not going to get the best spread. And uh, so which one will have more fluctuations in the flow and pressure? Well, that would be the one where you mix it upstream. So the next question is how to deal with evaporating liquid due to pressure drop inside the nozzle. And I can only assume that we're dealing with some sort of chemical here. I have not had a situation where that was an issue. And this might be a very specific application that we're, that we're dealing with here. Um, and I would probably need a little bit more information in order to, in order to uh, actually formulate a response for that one. Uh, another question is, do you have a specific recommendation for target nozzle DP and PSI for typical refinery packed beds that utilize spray distributors? Well, the, the packed bed itself, I mean, I, you know, obviously you wanna keep that DP as low as possible uh, and I don't know what that number is. And I think that would probably be something where the, either, either the vessel manufacturer or the pack bed, whoever supplying the packing material would have a better idea of that. All I know is that you want to keep it as low as possible. And I know that if you have poor liquid distribution, let's say you have something like a, like a vacuum tower and you have you start to have uh, coking or uh, dry spots on that, and you start to increase your delta P across the across that the, the pack bed portion of your vacuum tower, and that will start to create problems. But as far as what the actual delta P is, I'm I'm not really sure what that is. Uh, let's see. Another question is how to assess FCC feed injectors are performing as per design. Oh Lord, that's another that's another uh, involved question there. Uh, question there. Well, I think that if that if you're getting, I think that the the easiest answer is if you're getting if you're getting what you have have projected on the outlet of your riser reactor riser, then you're then it's probably performing as designed. If you're getting coke buildup, if you're getting 
if you're noticing that you're not getting uh, the pressure drop across the individual uh, feed injectors, then, then I would look at those as, as, as definite uh, problems. But as far as if they're performing per design, then, then all of your calculations and all of your design criteria to whatever your output from your reactor riser, then it should be working toward, design, toward the uh, per design. Next question is, is continuous steam or water injection common in a regenerator flue gas line for cooling? Are there design options for this mode of operation that ensure the flue gas line refractory downstream expander do not erode and catalyst wetting is avoided? Uh, is, that, is that common? No, it's not common. I think most, well, in my experience, it's not common. Uh, I have not seen that as far as continuous steam or water injection. Mostly what I've seen is what, what's called emergency quench because you, you want to be able to recover and utilize as much of that, of much of that heat in that regenerator off gas line as possible. So, but if you are spraying all the time, uh, for anybody that is, they're probably only spraying small amounts of water and that's to keep it with, you know, with, within a particular range and that liquid will pretty much evaporate, if it's designed correctly, it would pretty much evaporate uh, almost immediately or within reason and probably would not have any kind of erosion or, 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 or problems. But uh, if you, especially if you're installing the injectors in the duct system after the regenerator. The next question is, with hollow cone nozzles in the empty inner portion of spray area, what type services are best for this type of nozzle? In other words, what is the advantage of having spray only around the outer ring of coverage? Well, the advantage is, is, that, is that you're able to achieve smaller droplets and you're also able to uh, have a spray nozzle that has a larger maximum free passage. So in, in order to get that, that's, that's pretty much what that holocone nozzle does. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, hollow cone nozzles and full cone nozzles, especially in FCC units, are used a lot and interchangeably for the same application. And it, it all depends on, on what the goal is. Like maybe somebody's using a full cone nozzle and it's plugging, or maybe somebody wants to use a hollow cone nozzle because they don't have the, the, the clearance required in order to install a full cone nozzle. Or maybe there was a CFD model that was done and they saw that the holocone nozzle performed better because of the smaller droplets. Or maybe there was another application where a full cone nozzle was chosen because it had better performance based on the CFD model. Uh, so the advantage of having spray only around the outer ring of coverage, it just it, it has to do with the droplet size and it also has to do with the, uh, the maximum free passage that the nozzle by design has those attributes to it. Uh, I don't think, I don't think that there's any other questions listed here. I hope I answered them. I don't see any other uh, questions, Becky. Well, I just want to say a big thank you to you, Chuck, for presenting today, and thanks so much for everyone who joined us. This webinar will be available on demand for the next two weeks, so if you have colleagues that couldn't join us today, um, please let them know that they can watch it whenever they have time. You'll be receiving that link in your email within the next few hours. Uh, we do a lot of community building and announcements on LinkedIn. So if you're not connected with us, please join our RefCom events page or our FCCU cat cracking group so that you don't miss out on our um, other webinars and activities. Our next webinar is going to be a sulfur specific presentation. It will be held on October 25th and presented by Peter Harrison with the crew group. The registration is now open, so please plan to join us. I'm seeking presenters for the webinars in December and January. So if you have something to share, please contact me. And once again, thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Have a good day. Thank you.